I came across this story on uh, a visit to one of the scientists involved, but I was interviewing him at the time about something else entirely. He then started telling me about some of the other research he was doing, including, and I, you know, I thought this was amazing, he was uh, studying uh, killer whales and how they um, might be able to tell us about the evolution of menopause in us, in humans. So then he started telling me about the um, the reservoir of data that he was working on that was coming from this uh, group of uh, scientists out in uh, Washington State. And anyway, I, I was incredibly excited to hear about this research. I went back to uh, Radio 4 and pitched uh, a documentary idea based on going out one day, following these researchers on the water with the killer whales, um, and talking about how they were putting together this um, amazing story. Because it, it turns out that um, uh, only orca, humans, and one other species of primate whale have menopause as part of their life history. So some of these female killer whales are living decades after they've stopped reproducing. This is a, a clan of killer whales, and then their social structure is that they're divided into pods, and the pods are these um, are these familial groups and they're, they're very much now they know kind of led by this matriarchal figure that tends to be this older older female killer whale. There was all kinds of fascinating insights because one of the things that was so brilliant about um, this project and this story is that um, this population of resident killer whales off San Juan Island in the Salish Sea um, they've been studied for 40 years because they were actually a population of killer whales from which some of the captive orcas were, were taken in quite horrible circumstances. Young baby orcas were driven by boats and separated from their mothers. And as we learned through making this story, they have an incredibly intense and close family bond and social bond. And many orcas were, were taken away and put in captivity in marine parks. And because of that, this incredibly dedicated group of people set out to, um, to find out if this was in any way sustainable, if this population was being damaged to the point of putting its very survival in peril. And it turns out that they were. These people got these orcas protected and so they've spent 40 years they know every single one of these animals by sight by the markings on their dorsal fins because you know to solve that big evolutionary mystery you need decades of data because these are very long-lived animals we could have made a whole series of documentaries about these wonderful animals I think the scientists involved do worry that basically this incredible population is on a on a trajectory towards extinction I mean one of the vulnerabilities is that these um, these animals are um, predator specialists in that they only eat large fish and predominantly salmon and predominantly just one species of salmon, Chinook salmon. And the numbers, historically, you know, the numbers of that have been going down and down and down. Every season, when, every summer season, when the whole clan comes back together, they do this thing called a super pod. And apparently um, people go out to, to, to see it. You don't know exactly which day it's going to happen, but it's always kind of at the start of the summer season when the salmon are going to run and they're back to get this kind of bonanza of, of fish. They come back and they line up um, the, the killer whales in sort of two lines in the water and you see sort of all these dorsal fins kind of lining up. And apparently they, they sit there and they wait and they wait. And then at some point, just all hell breaks loose and they just have a big party. They, apparently they're just breaching and just jumping around in the water because, you know, these are very communicative, highly sociable animals. So there was lots of sound that we could hear of, you know, recorded by hydrophones under the water. It was much more kind of engaging as an audio story because you could really kind of just immerse yourself in it. You know, you didn't, it wasn't just sort of a passive watching of pictures. You know, somehow take the listeners there so that they kind of join Vic and the scientists um, on board the boat and you know through their through the, the word pictures that they paint um, and also the sounds of the environment around the lapping of the water on the boats the whale blows as the, the orca come up to surface and breathe you know capturing that and layering that into into the story I think is also uh, a key part to making a, a particular location uh, based documentary um, work.